Okay, Pentateuchal Criticism. You should have read for today the material on Pentateuchal Criticism that was on the portal. And this lecture will uh, pick up with that reading and uh, remind you of it, maybe clarify some of it. So when we talk about Pentateuchal Criticism, we're talking about the examination of a problem, a text, a passage to determine its authenticity, its reliability, or its meaning. Okay, so criticism is not inherently negative in its connotation. A critic, then, is one who does the examination. The term doesn't denote liberal or conservative, although I'll have to say most of the time, critic is used only in the context of a liberal by a conservative, okay? Though, uh, you know, it's not the liberals who call themselves liberals today, although the liberals did call themselves liberals when they became liberals at the beginning of the 20th century. Everyone is involved in biblical criticism when they study the Bible. <clears throat> Higher criticism asks the W questions of the passage under study. Who wrote it? So, was it Daniel that wrote Daniel? Isaiah that wrote Isaiah? How do we know? When was it written? What was its date? Why was it written? What's its message? And to whom is it addressed? Who's its audience? So anyone who asks such questions is a higher critic. They don't make one liberal or conservative. I mean, there's nothing in the book of Genesis that says Moses wrote it, so... To ask the question, who wrote Genesis, is a legitimate question that anybody interested in knowing who wrote it should ask. Okay. Lower criticism, which is also called textual criticism. I almost never hear textual criticism called lower criticism, except in a class that's explaining these terms. Okay. is concerned with the task of restoring the original biblical text on the basis of the many copies which have been preserved for us. In the New Testament, we have over 5,000 manuscripts, fragments of the New Testament. When it comes to the Old Testament, our data bank is not as extensive, but with the discovery of the Qumran manuscripts, we have certainly enlarged our basis for doing uh, an analysis of what was the original text of the Old Testament. Textual criticism attempts to sift the evidence provided by the variants or different readings. You say, well, what's a variant? Well, just as a classic example, in Genesis chapter 4, we have the story of Cain killing Abel. Okay? And our Bibles uh, read that Cain and Abel, uh, let's see, Genesis 4, just quickly... Verse 8, Genesis 4, 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field. Well, there are multiple Hebrew manuscripts that have something inserted between and Cain talked to Abel and when they were in the field. Multiple Hebrew manuscripts say, let us go to the field. <laughs> okay, and Cain said to Abel his brother, let us go to the field. And then when they were in the field. So the question is, is that phrase, let us go to the field, what Moses originally wrote, or was it something that somebody added later? How do we make that determination? Well, that's the study of textual criticism. Any questions about what I'm saying there? Yes. So Cain told Abel his brother what? You really expect some content after that introductory statement. Some Hebrew manuscripts have, let us go to the field. Uh, are you understanding what I'm saying or not? Okay, read the first part of the verse. Stop. Okay, that's what number one stands for. 
And what I'm saying is some Hebrew manuscripts have additional words between that and, number two, when they were in the field. So who's right? The Masoretic text that was used to translate the NIV or the NASB or whatever modern version or those other Hebrew manuscripts that have this additional text? Okay. That's the question. And uh, textual criticism attempts to set up a scientific system to arrive at what's most probably the original wording. Uh, we can never be 100% certain, but uh, how much doctrine does let us go to the field change if that w was really part of the original? <laughs> and that's the way 99.99% of the textual variants are. They really don't make any difference, which is very comforting to us uh, because that means God has miraculously preserved his word so that in contrast to almost all of the ancient Near Eastern documents that are fragmentary, major portions missing, key elements of the story gone, we don't experience that with the Old or New Testaments. A redactor is the term used to describe an editor who compiles the work of others. Okay. So, Pentateuchal criticism limits the critical study of the Bible to the first five books, Genesis to Deuteronomy, and it's primarily concerned with the higher critical questions of who wrote it, when did they do it, where did they do it, why did they do it, and so on. Now, you need to know, for the test, the difference between the three types of criticism that I'm getting ready to describe here, source criticism, Form criticism. Okay. Source criticism, as applied to the Pentateuch, seeks to discover the basic literary documents that comprise it. It tries to discover different authorship by noting peculiarities of style or vocabulary. Prior to the 1970s, it was called literary criticism. So if you read books that were published before the 1970s and you see the term literary criticism, they're talking about source criticism. After the 70s, literary criticism was used to apply to the analysis of literature, plot, character, point of view, temporal ordering. Okay? So source criticism is the preferred term now. So uh, did Moses use any documents in the compilation of the Pentateuch? Source criticism suggests yes. Okay. Um, source criticism doesn't suggest. Source criticism asserts yes. And we'll see what they say in just a minute. Historical criticism, again, a synonym for higher criticism. Uh, it's the term more commonly used today. In fact, you'll find it hyphenated, the historical critical methodology. And by historical critical methodology, they mean asking these questions that I've just talked about. Form criticism is the classification of the literary forms in which the biblical accounts circulated before being written down. Okay, so if source criticism looks for the documents that were used in the composition of a text, form criticism says, well, most material in the ancient world was transmitted orally. They would verbally repeat their histories, their genealogies, these would be memorized and they would be passed down from generation to generation, at least so the claim is, and usually based on studies of like African tribes or things like that. that uh, and so what was the form in which this material took before it was composed? It tends to stress uh, the Sitz im Leben, that's the German word, phrase, Sitz im Leben, for what we would say setting in life, or the life context out of which uh, a, a given material arose. So, uh, just for example, um, we recognize that the, there are certain <laughs> psalms that are lament psalms. And we seek to identify the life situation out of which that lament came into being. Okay. Well, that's
That's pretty easy to do with a psalm that says when David fled from Absalom. Okay, so we go back and read the story of David fleeing from Absalom and say, wow, tough time in David's life. This is the sitzim laban of this uh, psalm. But what liberal critics do is they want to want to reconstruct, not on the basis of the text, but on the basis of their imagination, or on the basis of what they believe went on in the ancient Near East, life settings for uh, the Pentateuch. I'll, I'll give you more examples of this in a moment. So, three kinds of uh, criticism I want you to be aware of. Source criticism, a little slow here. Higher criticism, form criticism. Now, we introduced the concept of presuppositions. I hope that this is review for you, but just in case, presupposition is something that's concluded before an investigation has begun. Okay? We should not allow our presuppositions or guiding principles of interpretation to warp or distort the facts. Now, my presupposition when I approach the Pentateuch is that it's inspired, therefore inerrant, and infallible. And as I said to my class last hour, the difference between infallible and inerrant is that inerrant uh, has to do with statements about the present or the past, whether they are errant, having error in them or not. Infallible has to do with statements about the future whether they will come to pass or not. And when Jesus says in John 10, 35, Scripture cannot be broken, he's, he's saying in the context that all that God has said will happen, will infallibly, unfailingly come to pass. And so I assert both of those about Scripture. It's inerrant. All that it affirms about the past and the present is true. And it is infallible. All that it asserts about the future will most certainly take place. Make sense? Everybody with me? Questions? All right, those are my presuppositions. Uh, the basic presupposition of a liberal is anti-supernaturalism. Okay? And this is not the conservative straw man of the liberal. This is the liberal's self-description. The argument whether you're a historian uh, or a philosopher, more in the historian vein of things, though, is that all events in the natural world have natural causes. Because those are the only kinds of events that we can see, we can investigate. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the, the logical fallacy here. Uh, that's like the drunk man saying... Uh, to the person who, you see this drunk man scrabbling around down on the sidewalk under a, under a light, uh, a lighted light, it's dark outside, and, and you say, sir, what are you looking for? And he says, well, I'm looking for my keys. And you say, well, did you drop them here under the light? He said, no, I dropped them over there, uh, on the grass in the dark. Well, sir, why are you looking here in the light? Well, because this is the only place I can see. Okay. So the historian says, well, the only kind of cause that I can investigate is a natural cause. Therefore, <laughs> that must be the only kind of causes that exist. Arrgh! Logical fallacy. Right? It's not the case that our inability to uh, verify in a Cartesian kind of certainty method supernatural causes disqualifies them from existing. But this is the presupposition. The disbelief either in God's existence or in his intervention in the natural order of the universe. The average modern critic or historian working with this presupposition rules out any reference to the supernatural as being unhistorical, or as they prefer to term it, myth. Okay, so Genesis 1 is myth, given this presupposition. So a God speaking things into existence, that's got to be myth. Okay, Every miracle described in Scripture then becomes myth. And so you get in New Testament studies, Boltmannian, Boltmann, a German New Testament scholar, who demythologizes 
apologized the gospel. He wanted to get rid of all of the supernatural elements and get back to the real historical kernel. And what he did was, of course, mangle the gospel and wind up with nothing. Now, when it comes to the authorship of the Pentateuch, both Jewish and Christian scholars, with a handful, no more than five exceptions, generally agreed that Moses was the author of Genesis until the 1800s, which is the 19th century. This was based largely on the statements from Scripture itself, some of which I referenced in my first lecture. In addition to the statements of the Old Testament and Jesus, other New Testament writers affirmed Mosaic authorship. For example, the Apostle John says the law was given through Moses. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 10.5, Moses writes, and he quotes Leviticus 18.5. So, that is, uh, that's the conservative background of the first 1800 years of the church's understanding of the Old Testament. Then come along, and I'm going to uh, introduce to you the history, or in this case the prehistory, of uh, liberal Pentateuchal criticism. Thomas Hobbes uh, lived 1588 to 1679, accepted Mosaic authorship generally, but he questioned authorship of texts like Genesis 12:6 and Deuteronomy 34, verse 6. What does Genesis 12:6 say? Well, it says, And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of uh, Sichem, unto the plain, or the early, the oak of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. That phrase right there is a problem. Thomas Hobbes says, Woo, wait a minute. Archaeology doesn't find any evidence of Canaanite occupation of Palestine until the 1200s B.C. Abraham, according to scriptures, living in the 1800s B.C. There couldn't be any Canaanites in Palestine. So Moses couldn't have written that because that's not true. Now, the assumption, of course, is that absence of of evidence is evidence of absence, right? Because we can't find any evidence of them, they must not have existed. <laughs> okay, you know that's as full of holes as as uh, offense. Okay, Deuteronomy thirty four six. I think uh, is a key statement about. Uh, well, let's see. Moses' burial, and he, that is, the Lord, buried Moses in the valley, in a valley in the land of Moab against Beth Peor, but no man knows his sepulcher until this day. Did Moses write that? Well, like I said, we're not bothered if Joshua wrote that, but that was a question that Thomas Hobbes uh, raised. Baruch Spinoza was a Jew living in the 1700s, 1600s, 17th century. He argued that anachronisms are evidence of later authorship. He said, quote, the belief that Moses was the author of the Pentateuch is ungrounded and irrational. Okay? He proposed that Ezra had composed the law, incorporating some things that went back as far as Moses himself. Okay? Richard Simon, a French priest and Hebraic scholar, wrote uh, a French book entitled A Historical Critique of the Old Testament in 1678. And in it, he denied the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. So Spinoza, Simon, here in the mid-1600s, they're kind of weirdos in a, in a century dominated by Puritans, century dominated by orthodoxy and confessional belief. Uh, from Richard Simon's, Seaman Simon's perspective, Moses could not have written the Pentateuch because it contains historical details and refers to events about which Moses could not have known. For example, the Philistines, who did not arrive on the coast of Palestine until at least a century after the latest plausible date for Moses, are referred to 
in the Pentateuch. Okay? Again, now he's not depending on archaeology, he's depending on uh, Egyptology. And we find in the reign of Ramses II an account of the Sea Peoples who begin to invade Egypt and the Palestinian coast, and Ramses was reigning during the 1200s BC. Okay, so the Philistines were Sea People. They came from the Aegean area, probably from Greece, somewhere. And uh, the argument as well, since the Egyptians say they don't show up till the 1200s, uh, this is this is historically anachronistic. It's like talking about George Washington getting in his presidential limo and driving. Uh, somewhere. Uh, there weren't any limos back in George Washington's day. Or is Genesis 36.1. These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. Oh, Moses couldn't have written that because there was no king over Israel. How could he say before there was a king? That must have been after there was a king. See? Okay. Now that has a degree of plausibility to it. And I'll look at that text in a moment. Probably not this lecture, but next time. Uh, after this kind of prehistory, we get the development of schools of Pentateuchal criticism. Three basic liberal views, the documentary hypothesis, the next view, form criticism, which we talked about in a minute, and oral traditionists. Okay. The documentary hypothesis teaches that Moses did not write the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is actually a compilation of four basic documents written by independent authors over a period of about 400 years, beginning about 850, and gradually combined by unknown redactors, editors, who put it in its basic form about 400 B.C. Now we're talking the Pentateuch here with this. Other books like Daniel... Some people push as late as 90 A.D. after Christ. Uh, the more traditional liberal view would be pushing it into the intertestamental period in the 100s B.C. The key men, as we'll, and we'll look more at these men in a minute, are Astruc, Eichhorn, Groff, and Zellhausen, a French and three Germans. Form criticism teaches that Moses did not write the Pentateuch. It also holds that the Pentateuch is a process of compilation, but it differs from the documentary hypothesis in that it holds that the individual documents were themselves compilations developing from early oral tradition and were placed in writing only during or after the exilic period. And the key men here are Hermann Gunkel and human Hugo Gressman. Okay. Oral traditionists, uh, these guys who were Scandinavian, completely reject the documentary hypothesis. That's a bunch of junk. Okay, The oral tradition is what it's all about. There are two basic sources of tradition for the Pentateuch, one that includes Genesis to Numbers and points to a priestly school of tradition. There were these priests who... Uh, got together, developed, developed their sacrificial system, developed their priestly rituals, and then they began writing. And what they did, or, or no, they didn't begin writing, they began talking and developing an oral history in order to justify their priestly setup. Right? So basically what they're doing is they're creating this story, this back story that justifies what they've developed. And eventually it gets written down, and, of course, they were clever enough to make it sound as though the story was about the, the people that they were trying to control or dupe with their <laughs> priestly methodology. Okay? The other is D, Deuteronomy through 2 Kings, which exhibits a different style than P and points to a D circle of traditionists. Okay? Key men, Johannes Pedersen and Ivan Ignell. Now, how did the documentary hypothesis develop? Well, it went through six stages. You'll need to know these stages for test one. Okay, you say, Dr. Phil, why are you, this is boring. We don't believe any of this stuff. Why are you taking the time to go over this? Well, I agree with you that it's boring. Okay, but uh, there's a biblical reason why I'm taking the time to go over this. And that is, in Titus 
chapter 1 and verse 9, here's what Paul says. An elder must hold fast the faithful word as he has been taught, so that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to refute, King James says convince, refute the gainsayer. So if somebody shows up in your church and talks about, raises all the questions that people have raised historically about the Pentateuch being Mosaic and whether it was actually inspired and on, and you've never heard any of this stuff, and you have no idea how to go about refuting it, you're not equipped to refute the gainsayer. So as in any uh, sport, so to speak, that involves an opponent, Part of smart strategy is studying your opponent's methods so that you know him as well as he does, so that when he uses his, you can outbox him, run him, maneuver him, in this case, arguing. Okay? So that's uh, what's at the motivation for taking time to do this. Six stages, two documents. Frag the two-document hypothesis was followed by the fragmentary hypothesis, Supplementary hypothesis, crystallization hypothesis, four documents hypothesis, and then the final documentary hypothesis. So we're going to work our way through this. First, a guy named H.B. Witter, Witter in German, a uh, German priest, uh, was reading his Hebrew Bible. And as you can see on the screen here, uh, he read Genesis 1, Bereshit bara Elohim et ashamayim vet ha'aretz hayata tohu Hayata tohu vavohu. Something's wrong. I've cut off some of the text there. He noticed that it says, and God created the heavens and the earth. And then he came over to Genesis 2, and he, he said, oh, looky here. It says, Yahweh Elohim. And Yahweh Elohim formed the man from the dust of the ground. And Yahweh Elohim. Look at this. Elohim, Elohim, Elohim. Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh all the way down. Ah! Two different authors. One guy, the Elohist, he uses Elohim. The other guy, the Yahwist, he uses Yahweh Elohim. Okay? So, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, two parallel accounts of creation distinguishable by the use of different divine names. Jean Ostruc, a French physician, gave the first significant treatment of the use of divine names in the parallel accounts of creation. But, Astruc defended Moses as the author, as the compiler. Yeah, maybe he, he had two different accounts. No problem there. But Moses was the guy who put them together. J.G. Eichhorn, 1780, the father of higher criticism, was the first to introduce Astruc's theory to Germany, and he suggested that critical source analysis be implied to the entire Pentateuch, based not only on divine name usage, but also on style and word peculiarity. So you can see how they say, well, hey, if that happens in Genesis 1 and 2, where else does it happen? Let's apply this throughout the whole, Old Test the whole Pentateuch, and uh, maybe there's a unique set of vocabulary that shows up in some places, maybe there's unique styles, and he rejects Mosaic authorship. Alexander Geddes, 1800, he called Astruc's documentary theory a work of fancy. Psh, what a bunch of nonsense. Was wrongly regarded by another German scholar named Father as a fragmentist, but believed that ancient documents and journals were used by a compiler in the time of Solomon. Aha, Solomon. So that'd be the thousands and nine hundreds B.C. to form the Pentateuch. So Moses is out of the picture. We're all the way down to Solomon's time. Johann Vater, a contemporary of Geddes, studied the uh, Old Testament, and he came up with 38 fragments that were sewn together by redactors. Some redactors were really neat, and so the seam is almost... Redactors were really neat, and so the seam is almost seamless. Okay. Other redactors were kind of sloppy, and you get this kind of 
uh, gingham patchwork looking quilt thingy where the text is kind of messy. All right. Some of the fragments were from the time of Moses, but the Pentateuch as we now have it was compiled about the time of the exile. All right, so, wow. We've moved from Solomon all the way to the exile, 586. That's the fragmentary hypothesis. Willem de Vet, de Vette, Wilhelm de Vette, uh, proposed a D source created in the 7th century during Josiah's time. Now, de Vette is kind of like, he's at the... Uh, <clears throat> If people don't give all the background that I've already given you, they'll start with Devetta. Because his idea was that Josiah, do you remember Josiah was the one who had the temple cleaned out and the priests were in there and they found a scroll and they came out and they read it and Josiah was like, oh my word, we're under the wrath of God, this is terrible, call all the people together, let's read this to them. Okay, well that's a, that was actually a pious fraud. The truth of the matter was that Josiah, together with the priests, wrote this whole material called, called Deuteronomy. They, they just created it. They created Moses. They created the historical setting based, I'm sure, on the myths that circulated around in Israel at that time. And then they pretended to find this in the temple, and they established... Uh, this religion. Okay. So that's the liberal view. Josiah made this up, and the priest, they made it up. And, this, and the Veta was the first to suggest this idea that uh, the point was to bring everybody from off of the high places, off of the other places of worship, centralize them in Jerusalem, make Jerusalem and its temple the central location of worship, and this text was a means of accomplishing this really political and religious objective. Okay? Now, about... <clears throat> well, what was Devetus? 1805. Okay, so about 40 years later, uh, Heinrich Ewald publishes, and he deals what he what's considered the death blow to the fragmentary hypothesis, that there are all these fragments that got sewn together. He proposes the supplementary theory. He felt like the first six books, we don't have a Pentateuch anymore, we have a Hexateuch. Okay? The Hexateuch had an Elohistic writing as its basis, so somebody who liked to talk about Elohim, God, but a later parallel document which used the divine name Yahweh or Jehovah arose. And still later an editor took excerpts from this J document and inserted them into the E document. So it was a supplement. The base is E, and J is kind of like sprinkled in there, which is why we see more Elohim than we see Jehovah, so they say. Okay? I guess I don't have a picture of... Oh, yes, I do. Here he is, Heinrich Ewald. He changed his mind, however, and uh, said, nope, everything I said about supplementary was wrong. Uh, this is actually a crystallization uh, instead of one major supplement, we now have five narrators who wrote various parts of the Pentateuch at different times over a period of 700 years. <clears throat> so, yeah, it's kind of a, a, a supplement, but it's more like a crystal grows. <clears throat> Given the right conditions, it'll grow a while, and then if the conditions cease, it, it ceases to grow. Then you have the right humidity, the right chemical, whatever, and it'll grow some more. Right, and so you get this, this crystal development of the Pentateuch, according to Ewald. <clears throat> As you can see, the 1800s was the heyday for the documentary hypothesis development. Uh, Moses was out, inspiration was out, in was historical science. We're going to find out how they really did it. Okay, and so... The way to get your dissertation published is to say the guy who wrote his before you is wrong and that your idea is better than his idea. So we just have this uh, spiraling sequence of theories. Who felt? Felt that there were four, okay? We just saw Ewald say five narrators. No, there's not five, there's four. <clears throat> there's the priestly document, P. 
the Elohistic document, E, the Yahwistic document, J, and then there's the Deuteronomic school, Deuteronomy. And P, E, and J were put into the present form by a redactor, and Deuteronomy was an entirely separate document added last. So the order would be P, E, J, D. First the priest wrote, then the Elohist, then the Yahwist, then the Deuteronomic school. Not really an author, but school. Okay, Carl Graff said, no, nah, you got the order wrong. Oh, I think you're right about the documents, but the order's wrong. Really, we started out with J and E, and then they got combined, and uh, Deuteronomy kind of got fed into from J, E, and then there was another second Deuteronomy school that fed into the first Deuteronomy school, and then we get Deuteronomy, and, and that got added, plus the priest and J, E, and a whole bunch of redacting going on to the Torah. Oh, I don't have any idea what this is. Okay. Maybe that's like uh, um, uh, the um, Samaritan Pentateuch, which has some differences uh, from the Masoretic text. Okay. Finally, the master shows up on the scene. Julius Wellhausen, a Jewish German who skillfully and eloquently formulates Groff's view. So, Karl Graf. Karl Graf had the smarts to think up the idea, but Wellhausen had the literary artistry. He, he knew how to write a good book. He, he knew how to make it all seem plausible and easy to read at the same time. Okay. And uh, he is the one who gave the classic expression to this view and brought it to prominence in Germany. So it's frequently called the Graf Wellhausen theory, and many times simply the Wellhausen documentary hypothesis. Okay, so he's kind of at the pinnacle of this development. <clears throat> so here's what he wrote: J was first, 850; E was second, 750. Compiled into JE by around 650. 621 comes D, written at the time of Josiah. Like I said, P, the priests, far from being at the front, they're all the way at the end. So all this post-exilic stuff, Ezekiel, Ezekiel was probably part of this priestly school that came up with all this idea about the sacrificial system and so on. And it's compiled, J-E-D-P, into its present form about 430 to 400 B.C. <coughs> And here's a diagram, if you're interested in studying, it's in the slides that are on the portal, that uh, reflects this four-source theory and kind of expresses how it came to be. Uh, this is taken from a book that teaches this is actually the way it happened. They, this is, so this is the, the liberal presentation of their own view. Okay. Now, you need to know the people who are associated with this. Some of these names are still significant names in Old Testament studies today. Julius Wellhausen in Germany. In England, a man named W.R. Smith introduced it, but S.R. Driver, Samuel Rolls Driver, gave it its classic presentation to the English-speaking world. Okay. Driver is a significant Hebrew scholar. S.R. Driver and his son G.R. Driver uh, both published significant grammatical analyses of Hebrew language. Okay, so as a Hebrew student myself, I run into their material a good bit. Some of it's helpful. In America, a man named Charles Augustus Briggs became the most notable and early advocate of this view. Although it got him in trouble, he, he was tried for heresy and defrocked by... Uh, the Presbyterian Church for espousing the documentary hypothesis. Okay, so the conservatives just didn't roll over and uh, and cry uncle. Uh, they um, asserted the truth, wrote books about the truth. They brought to trial people who were asserting heresy. But the problem is they kept sending their students to German universities to get uh, brainwashed with the very stuff they didn't want coming back. Okay, 
You know, you will be influenced by the people who instruct you. So if you want your kids to have a biblical worldview and hold the values that you hold, you shouldn't send them to a school that doesn't have a biblical worldview or hold the values that you hold. Well, my kids will be strong enough. One in a thousand. One in a thousand. Okay, so Wellhausen, Germany, or Wellhausen, England, is SR Driver, America, CA Briggs. Again, the key presuppositions, anti-supernaturalism, an evolutionary development of Israel's history. I talked about that with uh, <clears throat> the uh, reference last time to the Hegelian dialectic and Hegel's view of the development of history. And stylistic differences point to different authors. You know, you always write the same way anytime you write. And if in your diary is ever found a different style of writing, it will be clear evidence that somebody besides you did the writing, right? Bunch of baloney. Nonsense. I have all different kinds of styles. I have colloquial style. I've got formal scholarly style. I've got poetic style. Right? I've got conversational style. I've got a whole range of styles that I write in. And so this is uh, a, a major weakness in the uh, presuppositions. Now, what are the consequences of this view? So, well, I mean, does it really matter if God inspired a bunch of people at a bunch of different times to put the Pentateuch together? Well, no, except that the Bible says that Moses wrote it. And if Moses didn't write it, then guess what that makes that statement in the Bible? Errant. And if it's wrong about Moses writing the Pentateuch, what else is it wrong about that it affirms historically? We're 2,000 years away from the first century. Maybe it's wrong about the resurrection. Okay? So, it makes the Old Testament essentially unhistorical makes Israel's religion totally natural, not supernatural. So, you know, a friend of mine uh, who was the president of Marlboro College and I met in China in 1989 and 90 uh, believes that <clears throat> religion has evolved, evolution just like we have evolved. And you start out with spiritism, you know, and, and you, you, you grad, well, actually you start with animism, everything's, got spirits in it, and then you kind of narrow that down to there's a spirit world, and then you get polytheistic, there's stronger spirits in that spirit world, and then you get henotheistic, well, out of all the gods that do exist, there's one that's kind of like the, the muscle man, and he's the big guy, and then finally we arrive at monotheism, and monotheism says, no, nah, there aren't any other gods, there's only one god, okay. and uh, the Old Testament has elements of animism and spiritism and polytheism and henotheism. And we just have this evolutionary development of the uh, religion that's re that is contained there. My last point, the one who denies Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch aligns himself against the testimony of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> 